All right, if you would open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, and we will continue in our series in the book of Acts. And can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? All right, there we go. So in, in the book of Acts, we've been waiting uh, for quite a while uh, to get to this sermon. We, for, from the very beginning, I've been looking forward to talking about the very next chapter in your life and the very next chapter in the life of our church. Um, when I was very, very young, uh, like uh, I think I was four, I went to a preschool and they taught us how to fold our hands like this and they taught us how to do something like this. I used to be able to do it. And you do this, look, here's the church and there's the steeple, open the door and see what? It's just not true. <laughs> it's just not true. I mean, this is not the church, right? A building is not the church. The people, we are the saints, the church. We are the church. I'm not, uh, there's, there's symbols that teach truth, and then there's symbols that lead us off course just a hair, just a little. And so in the process of studying the Scripture, we literally are to set straight the truth, confront any wayward beliefs within our heart and bring it back together. And so when we talk about the church, which actually is one of my favorite subjects in Scripture, to talk about God's group of people who are saved, are redeemed, are forgiven, are predestined, the elect. They are blood-bought. They have been declared righteous through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are empowered with the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about us. We literally have gifts that have been given to each one of us. And as we come together as the body, we literally are, according to Scripture, an unstoppable force. And as we, are, we as followers of Jesus, are to continue the ministry of Jesus that we see in the book of Acts. In fact, you're, you may have a title above the book of Acts, and it'll say something like the Acts of the Apostles. That's what Acts stands for, the Acts of the Apostles. And that is a great way to def- to define it, but if they had more room, they would probably say something like this. This is the acts of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit through common people like you and me, and that we make up the church. But that's just a little too long to put on one page as a heading. So they just say the acts of the apostles. But in all reality, what we're talking about here, all that you and I have studied in the book of Acts reflects what you and I are to do in this world. It literally is a reflection of, and the reason that Luke uh, recorded this, as he says in the very first and second verse, he did this so that we would know what Jesus did, what Jesus taught, and then the Holy Spirit empowers us to live life today. Now, let me ask you, do you feel like you're living in Acts 29? Do you feel like you're continuing that? Acts 28 is the end of the book, But Acts 29 is not being written. In fact, think about this. I mean, Luke is very much alive and well. And imagine if Luke, you know, the book of of Acts doesn't end, right? It doesn't have a proper ending. It's just it's kind of left open-ended. Maybe when Luke got to heaven, he's continuing to write the book of Acts. And he wrote about what John did and what the rest of the apostles did after the canon, after the Bible was closed. He wrote about the first century, the second century. He wrote about Athanasius. He wrote about all these great men and women of God throughout history. And today he's still writing. So what would he write? What would he record about your life today as you're living it out? That's something to think about. In fact, it's, it's incredible. Um, as Luke continues to write, would he see me as someone like Eutychus? Remember Eutychus? No, remember? The guy that fell asleep in church? He fell out the window and he died. Don't fall asleep in church. I'm just saying. Maybe, maybe he's talking about Demas. Maybe he's writing about Demas. You remember Demas that we went over? Demas was a guy that was going good. Then all of a sudden he went south. He had a hard time. 2 Timothy 4, 10 says, because Demas has deserted me and he has loved the things of this world instead of the things of God. And so there's this constant contention With those who are followers of Christ, are we really going to believe what He says? Are we going to participate in what the Spirit is doing? 
or are we going to be hoodwinked by the things of the world? See, what God has for us and what unfolds in the very second chapter of Acts is what Joel said in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And it says this in verse 28. It says, After, after this, I will pour out my Spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my Spirit on male and female slaves in those days. In other words, the Holy Spirit's power is to be exhibited in every single believer and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is a radical concept to this world. It was a radical concept to the people of God at the time that the book of Acts was written. They thought that God only spoke and worked through professional holy men or professional holy women. But he said, look, in these days, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to do something powerful. And I am going to pour out my spirit upon all kinds of people. That includes you. In fact, that is for you. That God can use you to do exactly what he wants to accomplish through you and in you in your life. And so what we see in the book of Acts is what we should be seeing today. Now, we don't mimic anything, right? But we, mim we don't mimic any kinds of miracles or any kinds of sermons, but we mimic the way that the Lord worked in each individual and the way that he changed them from the inside out. And I want to tell you this. I want to give you three things that we're, we are very much the same. We have the same love. We have the same gospel. We have the same mission. And we have the same power. We have the same love. We have the same gospel. We have the same mission. And we have the same power. And so we should be functioning just as they function because of this. You say, Brother Mac, why did you start with they had the same love? Well, I'll tell you why. Because actually, love is essential. In John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he says this, I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus made it very clear. The mark of a Christian and something that is very attractive to the lost is this incredible love that we have for one another. Jesus says, you are to love one another in the very same way that I love you. Some people say that he's referring back to how he washed their feet. Right? Jesus took the disciples, and back in those days, they didn't wear Nikes, right? They wore, they wore sandals, and they didn't have very many socks, right? So their feet were always constantly dirty. And when you came in the house, the mom would say, take your shoes off, wash your feet. But what Jesus did, he said, no, 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 let me wash your feet. In fact, it was so odd for him to do it. Peter said, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. You're the Lord. He said, look, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me at all. Nothing. And what was he saying? This is the way. This is how we live. We are to love one another. In fact, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, their love for one another intensified. The fruit of the Spirit starts off, the very first word, the very first fruit is what? Love. Love is powerful. Love is not, uh, uh, love is not naturally natural, right? It's not naturally natural. In fact, if you look around in our society, it seems like hate is winning, right? That's what it seems like. But God says, I'm coming with power, and I'm going to give you the ability to love, and this love is fantastic. In fact, we see this in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and it's, it's kind of a theme verse around here because we love this passage. And he says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now look at verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common, and they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to, all, to any who had needs. So when somebody was needed, was needy, they couldn't stand owning anything until they sold it and they took care of the problem of their brother. They loved each other to the extent that it cost them. Love within the body is a clear mark of line of demarcation that separates us from sin and self 
and giving ourselves to others. In fact, uh, I did a little study, just opened up and looked at all the areas and ways that we are to love one another. And if you, if you want this copy, there's some in the back at the counter and you can get it. That's how profound this is. And as we live in Acts 29, according to the ministry of Jesus, we are to love one another and you will find that you have plenty of opportunities at Glen Meadows Baptist Church to love one another. And here's how you do it. In fact, there's several verses that just say love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. Too many to go over, actually. But let me just give you a summary in how this manifests and how this works itself out. How do I love one another? You're like this. The Bible says in Romans 12.10 to honor one another. 1 Peter 5.4 says to greet one another. Romans 5.7 says to welcome one another. 1 Peter 4.9 says to show hospitality to one another. 1 John 1.7 says to have fellowship with one another. Then it goes on, agree with one another. How about that one? You had a problem with that already, right? This morning. Agree with one another. Live in harmony with one another. Be at peace with one another. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another. Bear with one another. Bear one another's burdens. Comfort one another. Care for one another. Confess sins to one another. James 5.16. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Build one another up. Exhort one another. Instruct one another. Teach and admonish one another. Sing with one another. Stir up one another to love and to good works. Isn't that great? But if that's not enough, do good to one another and serve one another. Wash one another's feet. Wait for one another. Be humble towards one another. Submit to one another. Speak the truth to one another. Do not speak against one another. Do not judge one another. Do not provoke one another. Do not envy one another. Clearly, this phrase, to love one another, is all through Scripture. And I think that the fact that it's said over and over and over, and then it gives detail of how we do it, I think this is vital to the Lord God Almighty. I think it is vital for me and for you to love one another like this. This is what we do. It's best, I mean, obviously, it's best when you do this in Sunday school, when you do this in your community groups, or when you do this in life groups, men's ministry, women's ministry. You get to know one another. I share with you my burdens. You share with me yours. And we're able to mobilize. We're able to move. And we're able to see the Lord work through you to us. Listen, isolation, separation, is not God's will for you. I mean, I've watched enough National Geographics or National, all these shows about wild animals, that it is the isolated, weak gazelle that gets eaten by the cheetah, right? It's the one that's isolated, that's not in the one another realm of things. And so when you're in a small group, you get to know one another and you get to see these things. But also, it's also good when you don't know specifically a person and you see them in need and you are mobilized to give them a word of encouragement, but to fulfill the one another passage. Let me tell you something. This works best when you're not doing it in the flesh, but you're doing it in the power of the Spirit. Those who have the gift of encouragement, the gift of hospitality, the gift of service, the gift of wisdom, you do it so effectively with so little effort. And it's the Holy Spirit working through you to another individual. It is the Christ in you ministering to the Christ in someone else and it's lifted up and we are the body of Christ and that's how we get strong. I will tell you, there are many churches that are plateaued or dying, not because they don't have the gospel, not because they're, good, they're not good hearted people. It is because they don't understand the concept of sacrificial love to the very, the very end that Jesus taught us. We are to love one another and that's exactly what the Lord has called you and me to do. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel loved? I pray you do. <clears throat> if you don't, then please pray for us that we might be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that we could love you clear to the bone. And brother and sister, if you desire to walk with God, then you and I should be praying that consistently. Lord, help me see who you want me to love today. And it's amazing what happens. It's amazing that those that fall into great trial and tribulation or maybe even to discouragement, when you begin to focus on other people, man, things just begin to fall off of you. The bad things fall off of you. 
the bondage begins to leave and you begin to see others the way Jesus does and you can't help yourself but to love one another. Amen? Let's talk more about this. Well, we can't. We've got to move on. Not only do we have the same love, but we have the same gospel. It is the gospel that is the power of God. So what is the gospel? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the book of Acts, when you see Philip, when you see uh, Paul, when you see Peter, when you see the, the deacons, when you see them sharing the gospel, there are seven characteristics in the book of Acts of what the gospel is, and this, this is just fantastic. So all the apostolic, meaning from the apostles, all the apostolic preaching contains at least six of these, or seven of these elements. And the first one is prophecies were fulfilled, and the new age was inaugurated by the coming of Christ. That's just a reality. That's, that's part of the gospel, that the gospel is a foretold story that not by accident, Jesus didn't just stumble into this. He became the central figure from eternity past that the Bible makes clear that Jesus was slain before the foundations of the world. Amen? When he came to earth, it was prophesied. We're going to look at that in the next few weeks as well. But also Christ was born of the seed of David. Also, he died for our sins, according to Scripture, to deliver mankind out of this present evil age. His death was purposeful. It wasn't just at the hands of the Jews or the hands of the Romans. It was God that put forth his son to die on the cross, right? He was buried. In other words, he was dead and not alive. And number five, he rose on the third day, according to Scripture. Also, Christ was exalted to the right hand of God as Son of God and Lord of the living and the dead. If you have a King James, it says, the quick and the dead. Amen? That's what it says. Verse 7, or number 7. He will come again as judge and Savior of men. I want to tell you something. This, my friend, is the gospel. People don't need uh, just to be renovated. People need to be transformed. People don't just need to try to work on their past. They need a new future. People need hope. And hope isn't just trying to muster something within yourself to self-actualize or to have some kind of self-esteem. The hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ that when you and I breathe our last breath, He will take you and me into heaven. What we need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the answer to the world's problems. Remember Billy Graham was talking about a time he went to a city, and of course they had some pretty fancy churches in the city and pretty modern churches in the city. And a bunch of churches got together, hosted the Billy Graham Association to preach a massive crusade. And 50 of these pastors got together. They were maybe a little too smart for their own britches. They got together and they just said, you know what? If we choose someone like that, preaching in an old-fashioned way, an old-fashioned message with an old-fashioned man, it'll take us back 50 years. That message got back to Billy Graham. And he said, oh, I'm sorry I misrepresented myself. I'm not trying to bring us back 50 years. I'm trying to take us back 2,000 years to the very gospel, to the very message. The message doesn't change. Maybe some of the methods change, but the message never, ever changes. It is something worth keeping intact because God is the one who orchestrated it, the gospel message. From eternity past, And we saw it fleshed out ever since we see that very first inkling of the gospel in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, where he talks about the woman's seed crushing Satan's seed's head, right? And that there would be an incredible rescue. And we see it unfolding all through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, then the prophets, We see it all through the Psalms, the the message of Jesus coming. And of course, in the next few days, we're going to be hammering this from the perspective of Mary, from the perspective of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Simeon. We're going to be looking at this very closely of what it means for the Messiah to come. But it has everything to do with God desiring to save the souls of man. But not only do we have the same gospel, we have the same mission. The mission. The mission is very specific. People don't really care so much about our church's music. I mean, we care a lot about it, but 
people who are hurting, they don't really care. They don't care about the temperature in this room. They don't care about how soft our seats are, what they really are looking for. They don't care about all the different things that a lot of church members care about, the color of carpets and the color of people and the color of things. But someone who's lost, they're not concerned about these things. They're, they they want to know how to keep their kids off drugs. They want to know how to have a, have a marriage and a marriage flourish without it falling apart. They want to know how to stay out of disabling depression and discouragement. They want to know the truth. And our mission is about all of those things. Our mission has nothing to do with these things that are physical, although these things are tools, a stage, a microphone, a chair. I hope it's soft. I want to be comfortable. But that's not our goal, right? It doesn't center around the things that most people want to center church around. It centers around the mission that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. And it is fantastic. Matthew chapter 28 is is the mission of every single church. You know, if you go to a church and they don't have this as their mission statement, something's wrong. Jesus said, this is the mission. It says, "The, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and he said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So our message is all about as we're going. As we're going, it is a, it is a going mission. And this mission is costly. We're about to enter into uh, a time of Christmas, and you know what's coming. It's the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We're going to be doing a a Lottie Moon Plus, and it's where we are setting a goal of $75,000 to collect over the next few weeks. And 75% of this will go directly to international missions. It doesn't go to anywhere in the United States. It goes straight to the mission field to help us as a collective of several thousand churches to see and to support the Five to 6,000 missionary families that are on the field, but also for the state of Texas. We have as many lost people in Texas as we had total population in Texas 20 years ago. So it's to reach, it's, and it's sacrificial. We are to, as we are going, not only do we give, but we also, we all personally go. You have been given the Holy Spirit, you, you know the gospel. You know that it's the answer to the ills and the condemnation on the world. And so we are to share the gospel and we are to do it powerfully. Not only do we share the gospel, but we take people right where they are and we are to turn them into fully functioning followers of Christ filled with the Holy Spirit on mission for Him. Amen? That's what they did in the book of Acts. All that joined the church became a part of the mission. And that's what they're about. We don't just tell people about Christ and then not disciple them. Have you ever gone fishing? And then you catch a whole stringer of fish and you get so, <laughs> you might've gone fishing, but you didn't catch a whole stringer of fish. <laughs> but say you catch a whole stringer of fish and then all of a sudden you leave it on the bank because you're so excited and you go home and you leave the stringer on the bank. That's like evangelism without discipleship, right? You catch the fish, but you don't clean them. And it's the process that we use. So we are all about the mission that the Lord gives us. And there's lots of examples of people and their lives being changed. Remember when I was young, I had, had uh, like a Boy Scout magazine called Boy's Life. I like, I like to watch uh, uh, Mechanical Science. I don't know why I like to read that. And then I had comic books. And in the back of every single one of them, there was an ad. And the ad was about Atlas Charles, I think his name was. Remember that? And it's this ad of this real skinny, scrawny guy sitting next to this real pretty lady, and this real muscular guy comes up, and he kicks sand in this real skinny guy's face, and he takes the girlfriend. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one that saw that? Yeah. Yeah. And then Charles. Charles Alice. That's right. So then, uh, but then this kid orders what he's supposed to order, and he pays a lot of money. Then he comes back, and he's all buff. And what you see is there is a transformation, and people are wanting these things. But let me tell you, I mean, we're, we're to take care of our bodies. There's no question the Scripture says that, but it does say this. Bodily discipline is of little value. It's got value, but it's little value compared to the transformation of a soul. And this is what we value more than anything else as a Christian. This is what you and I are to value more than anything else. Not, not the makeover of our house, although those are, those are good, those are great. 
Not the makeovers of our body. Those are good. Those are great. But they're not the most important part. The most important transformation is the transformation of your soul and my soul. It starts with being born again. Then it continues as I am putting off the flesh and putting on the spirit, taking off the old Mac and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what our mission is all about. But this mission requires a power. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we have the same power. It's the power from the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8 says it this way. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8 says, While he was with them, this is, this is at the very beginning of the book. Remember, we went over this. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. Verse 5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here's something interesting. Many people will say that the very last words are what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, what we read earlier about the Great Commission. It's the mission. Go ye therefore into the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. That's, that's not Jesus' last words. Jesus' last words were, wait for the power of the Spirit. Now listen to me. If it had been enough to just spend time with Jesus and learn all of his teachings and follow him and watch everything he did, to know the Bible inside and out, if that had been enough, then he never would have said, you need to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. But he did. I mean, think about Peter without the power of the Holy Spirit. Think what he did. He constantly said the wrong things. He constantly offended people including Jesus. He would think he's saying the right thing, but then turn around and the whole time say the wrong thing. In fact, there was a time when Jesus says, huh, G uh, Peter, you think you want to live strong for me? There's going to come a time where you deny me before men. He said, no, 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 not me, not me. And then, you know, when he was being crucified and the, croc the, the cock crowed three times, he realized he had denied the Lord Jesus Christ. But then under the power of the Holy Spirit, look at the difference in his life. Acts chapter 2, that sermon that he preached, the life that he lived, being an apostle who established the church. Jesus said, I want you to wait. I want you to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is for all of us. We, you and I have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's one of these things that grows incrementally. It's, it's, it's a filling. It's a, it's a present active of filling. It's, it's not just full like that. It's a filling. Now, obviously, when you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit of God. He dwells within you, but the feeling is something different. The filling is something that God, He's pouring into you constantly. And the reason we need to constantly be filled with the Spirit is because, according to Charles Spurgeon, we leak. We leak. Things happen. The Mac in me takes over the Jesus in me sometimes, right? It's the flesh, and it is a problem. But the Lord says, I want you to continually be filled with His Spirit. Now, listen, I, I, I am so thankful for the attitude of many, if not all, England Meadows, and I am thankful for the times that you all send me little articles or you'll send me a, an encouragement and it, it comes from a plethora of people and it's about hey did you hear about this the spirit moving in this church in a powerful way did you hear about the revivals that took place in this country and I hear it over and over and so you are hungry for these things and you desire these things and these are the things that we are to seek look <laughs> these are the things that are to be on the top of our minds 
that God moving in us and through us in a powerful way in order to love one another, in order to, to share the gospel the way he called us to share it, in order to be on the same mission as the Lord, it requires prayer. I mean, that's what he said. I want you to wait and I want you to pray. And they prayed 10 days. Now, why didn't they work on, why didn't God just fall on the first day that they prayed? I mean, why, why didn't he not, why didn't he do that? I've always wondered. I always wondered if it got to the ninth day and people said, this ain't working. <laughs> I mean, I'm hungry. I'm tired of fasting. This isn't working. And I imagine they said, no, 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 no. Let's just do what the Lord says. I have some opinions about this. I think the reason that they stayed so long and the reason that he said, wait for this amount of time is because things happen incrementally. There are things that happen to you and me while we go, while we go through the discipline, while we go through the, the prayer time, while we go through the exercise of denying self and putting the Lord first and great things take place. I, you need to know this. God's presence is incremental. God's presence and the way that he gives it takes place a step at a time. And it builds and it grows and it grows in your life. And I think the fact that many people don't understand that, they might pray one time and hope that everything changes. And sometimes it does, but that's rare. But what really happens is you begin to pray and you begin to press in and the Lord gives you more and more and more and more. And you begin to see the Lord high and exalted more and more. I hope to God that this is true of you and me, that today you have a greater view of Jesus than you did a year ago, right? And that, and that you're able, now you have more control of your temper through the power of the Spirit than you did before. See, the Spirit makes Himself known. And if the Spirit isn't known within your heart, then we have a problem. And, and we can overcome problems. It's not insurmountable. This, this lack of the Spirit working in your life is a problem, but it's a problem that can be overcome. But you have to want it. You have to desire it above anything else. You have to say, Lord, I want you and I want you to change me more than anything else. And when you begin to say that, then you're now off to a good start. First of all, you need to be saved. I, I pray you're saved. I mean, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, if you don't know where you'll spend eternity, if Jesus isn't your magnificent obsession, if you haven't repented of sins and confessed that Jesus is the Savior of your soul, He died on the cross, he was buried for three days. He rose again from the dead and he ascended on high so that he could be in this room right now to save you. If you've never given your life to Christ, then now's the time. But if you have and you want the Lord to take over more area of your life, then listen, you can. It, it's called sanctification. It's something you and I grow in. And the Lord begins to give his spirit to you without measure. And there are things that we do. It's, we call it the disciplines. You, you come to church. You get under the teaching of the Word of God. You, you fellowship. You learn to love one another. You, you begin to study the Bible for yourself. You meet with Jesus. Here's what you do. Let me give you these, let me give you these five things. You meet daily with Jesus. You say, how do you do that? Well, it starts with the Bible. You get with the Bible and you just open it up and you just read it. And, and the Lord is talking to you. You begin to worship Him. You, you might get a journal and you might make some notes and you might be really careful about what you write and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm looking at and you, you list it, you name it and you, you identify certain passages. You, you, you begin to study that passage and you begin to think deeply about that passage and in that passage you begin to engage in prayer and then you begin to know what God has spoken to you and then you, you begin again, you end with worshiping in the Lord. You also, you are to pray the scriptures, letting the Lord start the conversation. You know, when you're going to talk to somebody, particularly someone who knows a whole lot more than you do, you kind of let them lead the conversation because we don't know as much as we, they do. And so you let the experts lead the conversation so you can learn and you can ask questions. And so when you're talking to God, you let him start the conversation. How do you do that? You just read the word. You let him speak. It starts the conversation and you reflect back. And the Lord begins to show you things. 
So not only that, but you begin to love the brothers and sisters desperately. You pray for one another. You say, Lord, is there someone here? Is there someone I know? Is there someone around the world that I need to encourage? Also, you pray for that one person that needs to know Christ. You know, you, you're praying for one. You, you have your one that you're praying for, the one who is most likely to come to know the Lord at any time. And then you regularly meet for worship and encouragement and study of God's word together. Listen, I know churches want to make you feel comfortable, but we can't compete with you being in your pajamas on the couch eating your Captain Crunch. We can't compete with that. That's really comfortable, right? But there's something powerful about being among the body and being among people that can interact with you. Now, listen, if you're, if, if, you're, uh, if you're at home and I have family members, you're at home and you need to stay home because of health issues, I understand and praise God we have a way of streaming to you. But if you can and you can come to church, you should. You should. I know, we can't compete with how comfortable it is staying at home, eating Captain Crunch or whatever you're doing in your pajamas. That's, man, but however, man, if you don't live in this town, Find a great church. Find a Bible-believing church and just say, man, I want to grow with you guys. I want to be a part. Listen, this is how we live Acts 29. This is how we are to continue the work of the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit, working through common people like you and me. And brothers and sisters, this is what Glen Meadows is. And I thank God you're a part. And I pray for you. I pray for your filling. I pray for your focus. And that when God calls us to, we work and we serve him with all that we have.